Our second discussion in the care of psychiatric mental health clients revolves around the biological and then ethical and legal implications of the mental health nurse. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that convey information across the synaptic cleft from one nerve cell to a neighboring target cell. And these neurotransmitters bind with the receptor site on that target cell to cause an action, either a stimulation or a suppression. In this picture here, you can see serotonin being stored in a vesicle, being released into the synapse, triggering a response on the receiving neuron by stimulating those receptors. And then after binding, it's either uh, inactivated and dissolved by enzymes or there's a reuptake transporter that uh, picks up the neurotransmitter and puts it back into the vesicles. This is really a critical concept when you think about all of the um, SSRIs, SNRIs, all of the drugs that are reuptake inhibitors, that the way that they work is by trapping that neurotransmitter in the synapse and allowing it to stimulate those receptors longer. So for you, thinking about mental health nursing and thinking about the meds that we use, um, the concept of the neurotransmitter at the synapse is really critical. Our book outlines the major categories of neurotransmitters, which includes cholinergics like acetylcholine and the monoamines like norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and histamine. You should be able to draw a correlation between the monoamines being decreased in a cause in depression and being increased and activating mania, anxiety, and even types of schizophrenia. The amino acids like GABA, glycine, glutamine, and aspartate, and then neuropeptides, and those would be things like your opioid peptides, your substance P, and your somatostatin. Our body also uses hormones, which are controlled by the endocrine system, that act on target organs, not in the synapses, to help control and regulate the body. Physiological and psychological life cycle phenomenon are regulated by hormones and the circadian rhythms, and those are discussed in this chapter as well. Some of those processes include your mood, your sleep-wake cycles, your stress responses, your appetite, your libido, and fertility. So these are things that are regulated by hormones and circadian rhythms as opposed to neurotransmitters. Important diagnostic testing to think about in terms of uh, mental health and the brain. EEG, which looks at brain activity, the electrical activity, which we could be used to diagnose epilepsy or stroke. It can also be used to evaluate degenerative and metabolic disorders. Computerized EEG mapping is used in research to compare a normal brain versus a diseased brain, and they use a lot of that in the research on schizophrenia. CT scans look at general structures. It can also identify tumors, cancers, bleeds, traumas, stroke, aneurysms. MRI is going to give us a more detailed structure than a CAT scan. It can also show us demyelinization of the sheath, edema, ischemia, infarction, and cancer. A PET scan and the SPECT scans are NUCMED. They're radioactive, and they look at uh, brain function. The PET scan looks at glucose or oxygen metabolism, blood flow, and neurotransmitter receptor interaction, where the SPECT scan looks also at brain function but can also see CSF flow. Chapter 3 addresses some of the ethical and legal considerations. Ethical theories that mental health nurses should be aware of um, and uh, you know, kind of decide how they're going to determine how they're going to practice um, might be based on where they work and it might be based on their personal beliefs. Utilitarianism is the belief that you should do the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. So in essence, you're just going to do good or you're going to do right. And um, the thought is that uh, you're going to try to make people happy. Um, Kantianism is uh, more of a, a moral um, uh, kind of compass where 
you make a decision based on what you feel is moral or ethical regardless of the outcome. So you do what you think is right. Christian ethics is kind of that do unto others as you would have done to you and make decisions based on biblical teachings or the life of Jesus Christ. And um, an ethical dilemma. So one of the things that happens when a nurse undertakes a very specific ethical theory is that they might then experience an ethical dilemma where they have to choose between two conflicting or unfavorable options. And this occurs when what you believe personally and what you're supposed to do professionally um, clash or don't, um, don't overlap. Some ethical principles that we should be aware of, and we have covered these already, but just to kind of rehash some of them, um, and these are the ones that are, are really specific to mental health autonomy. So make sure you're respecting and protecting the patient's right to choose. Um, even if the patient is not mentally well, they still have autonomy. Advocacy, you should always act on behalf of the patient, support and defend them, and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Veracity, you should always be truthful. And the right to refuse treatment. Unless they're at risk of harming themselves or others, patients have the right to refuse treatment. And this goes along with autonomy. Patients also have the right to the least restrictive treatment possible. So we don't seclude, restrain, or sedate someone who does not absolutely need it. Instead, we would look for less restrictive options like putting the patient in, um, in direct line of sight, distraction, other activities. Um, in uh, um, long-term care facilities, they use sometimes like uh, ankle monitoring bracelets uh, so that patients can't get out of certain doors where it could be dangerous for them, but it gives them greater freedom within the unit, things like that. So you don't want to restrain or seclude someone into their room uh, when they could have um, a happier or less restrictive lifestyle. Some legal issues that also should be addressed. <clears throat> a tort is a violation of a civil law. And if you violate someone's rights, you are at risk for um, being um, charged with a, a crime. Um, intentional torts are purposeful acts that cause harm. So we have unintentional torts like negligence and, and things like that. But you also have intentional torts. And that would be your assault, your battery, your false imprisonment, and sexual harassment or sexual assault. In terms of privacy in the mental health client, HIPAA restricts us from sharing information with anyone who's not directly involved in the care of the client, but it does permit disclosures for safety, especially if they could impact patient care. So if a patient ever says to you, can I tell you something and promise you won't tell anybody else? The honest answer is no, because if it's going to impact your care, like if you tell me that you took an overdose or if you tell me you have a razor blade in your room or if you tell me that when you get out of here, you're going to kill yourself or hurt somebody else, um, that's a disclosure that I have to make. Uh, so you can never, as a mental health nurse, make a promise to somebody that you will not share what they tell you. Um, that's back to veracity, right? You have to be honest. <clears throat> Informed consent. So in mental health, um, just because patients have the right to autonomy and the right to refuse treatment does not mean that they actually are competent or capable of, um, of making informed consent. So if they lack capacity, they're going to need a legal guardian to speak for them. Informed consent is the legal responsibility of the physician and it's the responsibility of the nurse to make sure it's been obtained, but it's the responsibility of the physician to actually obtain it. Restraints are a high risk situation. And the nurse should speak directly to the patient regularly without overstimulating them to make sure that they're okay and to reassure and care for them. Being restrained can be painful. It can be very scary. You take away their ability to toilet themselves. Um, you know, if they vomit and they're restrained, they could easily aspirate. Anybody who is um, in you know, four point restraints needs a constant one on one, but then the nurse should be going in frequently at regular short intervals um, just to make sure that they're OK. You don't want to like wake them up and not allow them to rest. But at the same time, you really have to be checking on them. <clears throat> 
avoid false imprisonment. So don't seclude somebody who's a voluntary admission against their will. The only time that you can actually seclude someone against their will is if they're involuntary and they're at risk to hurting themselves or others. So let's talk about commitment for a second. <clears throat> Voluntary commitment is where a patient chooses to go. So they recognize that they have a problem. They recognize that they are not dealing with it well at home. They may recognize that they have maladaptive behaviors and they choose to go. They sign their own consent and um, they're taken wherever or admitted wherever. Oftentimes those patients also then have the right to leave whenever they choose to leave. An involuntary committal occurs when somebody is at danger to themselves or others, if they're actively suicidal or homicidal, um, or if they you know, just uh, can't uh, function in society. And then emergency commitment occurs if somebody is acutely decompensating, if they're delusional, if they're um, you know, a really high risk to self or others, or unable to function or care for their own basic needs. This does not mean that they're homeless because um, you can be homeless without needing emergency you know, committal. But uh, it does mean that they're completely unable to perform their um, you know, ADLs. So they can't bathe themselves, they can't feed themselves, they can't toilet themselves, uh, they can't obtain food, water, shelter, like they can't use the resources that are available to themselves just to meet their own basic needs.